Good evening, y'all, and welcome to this edition of History in Highballs, French Heritage of North Carolina. My name is Stacey, and I handle adult education here at the museum, so that means that whenever you sign up for one of these History in Highballs programs, you and I get to virtually spend the evening listening to some incredible stories about North Carolina places and people and what makes our state so special. If you enjoy tonight's program, we invite you to head over to the museum's website at ncmuseumofhistory.org, where you can learn more about our upcoming programs, exhibits, and digital resources. This is also where you can find inform more information about joining our North Carolina Museum of History Associates. Our Associates and Foundation provide crucial funding and support to the museum, which in addition to many other things, helps make programming like, programming like this evening's event possible. We would also like to thank those of you who graciously donated funds towards this evening's program. Uh, we do our best to keep our programs free to attend, but there are always costs associated with keeping our series going, and we just continue to be so appreciative of your generous support of the museum. A few quick housekeeping items for this evening. We ask that you please keep your mics muted throughout the entirety of the program, and to please type any questions that you have for our guest speaker into the chat function located at the bottom center of your screen. At the end of the program, our adult programs intern Adara will ask our guest speaker as many of your questions as time allows. So it's my honor to introduce and welcome this evening's guests. We have Jordan Madri, Registrar for the North Carolina Museum of History, Dr. Dudley Markey, Professor of Humanities for the Department of Foreign Languages and Literatures at North Carolina State University. And last but certainly not least, we have a special guest this evening, First Lady Kristen Cooper, who's actually in the audience joining us and is going to kick off our program by sharing an artifact from the French Gratitude Train that lives in the Governor's Mansion today. So let's check out the spe special message from First Lady Cooper. Hi. Welcome, come on in. I have something I'd like to show you in our library. When I um, saw that the History Museum was going to be doing a, a history in highballs about uh, the um, Mercy Train or the Merci Train, uh, you know, I was uh, realized that we actually have in the executive mansion what I've been told uh, was a gift that was on on a train and it is a, a Joan of Arc inkwell mm -hmm. and um I don't know if anybody has ever used an inkwell you open um these off uh, their little pots to put ink in and it looks like uh maybe a place to put maybe your, lay your eyeglasses down so that you know where they are when you're getting ready to do your writing in it in it I think it's bronze from the 19th century it weighs a ton so I'm going to sit it down and it's had pride of place here in the library at the executive mansion since I've lived here and we certainly intend to keep it here this is probably the room that gets uh seen the most on um it's used the most here um in everyday life for meetings and various things so a lot of people see it it's also if you come if we open are able to open up our tours one of the things that um it's easy to see um if you just look in through um the doors into the library so i hope you're enjoying the program and um uh, Come and see us at the Executive Mansion, too, if you want to get a up close and personal look at this. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, First Lady Cooper. I know that when the Executive Mansion is able to open back up for tours, I will definitely be looking for that inkwell. So now it's my honor to introduce our next guest for the evening, Jordan Madri, Registrar for the North Carolina Museum of History, who is going to share some special items from our collection. So, Jordan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Welcome. Hi everyone, like Stacy said, I'm Jordan and I'm one of the registrars here at the Museum of History. And what I have to share with you today is a couple of the artifacts that we have within our French Gratitude Train collection, which is hundreds of items that we got in 1949. Um, things from silver service trays, ceramics, toys, seeds, um, clothing, just anything that anyone wanted to actually donate and you know provide into the French Gratitude Train. So how I have over here, you can see all sorts of things, um, but I can see them a little bit closer. Um, there was a lot of random things that were brought um, in, like, for example, these two. These are um, salt spoons. 
So somewhere, someone uh, thought that that was very important for um, us to have, which is incredible. It kind of shows um, ornate details and just lets us know that this was something that someone really, really wanted to give. Um, we also got a lot of coins. The tiniest metals. And what you're seeing on a lot of these, these blue tags or um, some of these paper tags is how we track all of these artifacts. So normally we have a three part numbering system and it's normally the year that the artifact was brought in, the collection number, and then the number of artifacts within that collection. Um, but for this one, it was so interesting and so special that we decided to give it a letter in the front. So you'll see here, it says G.12.4. Normally you put um, G.1949.12.4, but you can see how tiny these tags are and that's not all going to fit. Um, so we just decided to put G for obviously gratitude train and then the collection and then the number um, within that collection that this artifact is. So not only do we put the tag on there, but we also physically print the um, number on the artifact. So just in case it gets loose for any reason, the tag, you can still see it in either the upper right-hand corner, on the back, um, anywhere where sometimes it does have to end up being obtrusive um, if you're gonna put it on display because we don't wanna compromise any of the actual textiles. For example, this is a seed bag. There are actual seeds in here. Um, so sometimes it has to be a little bit obtrusive or you know, something if you could see it on display. Other times we try to make it really, really tiny and put it on the bottom. So then that way that artifact number lives with it forever. So sometimes we have you know, ceramics that are this small. Sometimes they're very, very large. Obviously those won't fit. Um, we also have very fragile items as well, like this fan. This is something that would have to take a lot of care in order to make sure that this is treated right with any sort of uh, treatment or condition before this goes on display, because as you can see, it can start to crack. It's very fragile. But as you can kind of see also, these are really well taken care of. We take care of them very well. And they also came to us in great condition. Um, for example, we had toys. We had this car and it's a wind up car. The key actually comes with it. But someone somewhere thought that this was very important for us to have, which we are so, so grateful for. We also have this ceramic platter. We have much larger platters, smaller platters um, with really ornate details, hand painted. It's just incredible. And we have wonderful curators on our staff who do a really great job of cataloging all of this and trying to figure out what the stamps on the back mean, if there's any markings. Um, unfortunately, a lot of this, we do not know who it came from, where it came from. Sometimes people uh, provide cards. Um, for example, this one is a wall decoration that would sit on the wall and there would either be flowers or um, something, little trinket that would sit in here. But sometimes we get really lucky. For example, for these precious little baby booties, mm -hmm. they actually came with a card saying who it came from. So it says Madame Alberts, it has the street name where it came from and then an actual little handwritten note, you know, with love. So that's something that's really, really special that we can show on display and we can put kind of, you know, a person to these um, artifacts. It's the same person who gave this beautiful little baby bonnet. I mean, things like this are so fragile and you don't wanna handle them too much, but like I said, it's in very, very good condition. Um, we also got some, so you have some jewelry within the collection. This is a ring and this is a pin. Again, you see the artifact number on the back. <clears throat> Then, you know, just to show leisure, this is um, an ashtray. The things that people just were about, you know, for just general French everyday life, social life, culture. A pipe. And then this one, while it looks like a shoe or a shoe horn, it is actually a snuff box. So sometimes there's just little intricate things that just are incredible. Um, I also have a small plate. There's a lot of these, a lot of um, faces, ornate decoration. Um, there's still some gold gilding around here. And then of course, a nice stamp on the back, which is what our curators would try to figure out 
what that maker was um, about the year helps date it. And like I said, there's always fun toys and there's beautiful dolls. There was a lot of dolls actually in the collection. The, the majority of the things are textbooks, photographs, um, school books, um, just a, a lot. And a lot of it is repetitive, but some things are very unique like these dolls. And there's a lot of them, which just shows how precious that people thought that we would need something like this that would help um, just say thank you. So here's another doll. Beautiful, very large bow. And again, she has the blue tag on the back. While these blue tags are a little bit older, um, we don't really use these anymore. We actually use twill tape um, and archival safe ink and we sew them on in a much um, looser fashion. This is something that the collections department is trying to work on is to go back and try to take off all of these safely, all these blue tags and replace them with something better, which just happens within museum work. Um, sometimes a practice that was done a long time ago is not the way that we should do it now to keep the artifact safe or to keep the tag on there so you can um, see the artifact um, throughout its lifetime. So this is kind of a little sampling of what we have within our collection. Um, we have hundreds and hundreds of more. There's more clothing, um, lots of things. So this is just something that's an ongoing process for collections and curation. So we hope you enjoyed what you've seen. And if there's anything else that you would like to see or know about, please contact curator Diana Bell Kite. Um, depending, depending on the breadth of this entire collection, depending on what you would like to see, it might go to a different curator. Um, and if that's the case, then you might want to contact Relana Poteet because she is the chief curator. So thank you so much, Stacey. Thank you so much, Jordan, for sharing these rarely seen items in the museum's collection with us. This was really cool. Um, now I would like to introduce our final guest for this evening, Dr. Dudley Markey. Um, Dr. Markey received his PhD in comparative literature from Columbia University. He has been a faculty member in the humanities at NC State since 1989, and he recently published France, the French Heritage of North Carolina in 2021. Welcome, Dr. Markey. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And... Um... Thank you for all having me, and I hope everybody enjoys the highballs. And it's uh, Bastille Day in uh, France, and it's uh, oh, it's a little after one o'clock in the morning. I just had a friend text me, and uh, he is still out on the streets drinking champagne and dancing. So, vive la France! I'm going to share my screen. Everyone see that? Okay. So France, the French heritage of North Carolina. Um, I'm gonna just give you just a brief little overview of, of the project, which took me 10 years to do. So it's fairly extensive. And then um, provide a context for uh, the French gratitude train, which we'll talk about in a bit. So most people are not aware of that of, they see the, the NC and the French there about the French heritage of North Carolina. Of course, North Carolina, uh, settled primarily by British and English. And then of course there were Scotch and Germans and Palatines and Welsh and a lot of other people. Um, but there's a, a subtle but significant French heritage in North Carolina. And when I first started doing the book, it was really just an article I was working on for Our State Magazine with some French place names that I saw on my travels throughout the state. And that uh, sort of research started to grow and then it became, uh, became a book. This is just a fanciful uh, little drawing. Uh, this is a previous title of the book, The Other French Connection. People know about the French Connection. You can see the large NC in there. And the large NC, I'll have to uh, give that um, credit to my wife, Beverly, who came up with that. She's a visual person and came up with a large French NC. So the publisher, McFarland Publishing, uh, they did a very nice job with the book, but they thought the large NC you know, clever as it was, they thought it was a little too cutesy um, for the cover. So they took it out and they left it in the book in a couple of spots. And um, again, I'm not here to promote or sell my book tonight. If people do buy the book, I think you really enjoy it. It's written for a general audience. It has a lot of images and you get to travel all throughout North Carolina. And whatever um, meager royalties that do come my way, I funnel them back to NC State University Scholarship Fund for first-generation college students, of which I am one. This is a table of contents to give you an 
idea of the scope of the book. And so the left-hand column here, this is the first half of the book. And we're gonna to talk tonight real briefly just about the first discoveries and about Huguenot migrations. And this is the beginning of the French presence in North Carolina. It begins with the Huguenots, spreads to places like Bath and Craven County, New Bern, Beaufort, um, and throughout all Eastern North Carolina. And the second part of the book, continues this westward migration uh, through the Piedmont, Le Pied du Mont, which is actually a French term, all the way out to the west of Biltmore. And this chapter here, for any of you who know a little French, Vive le Sud is, is Long Live the South. And this chapter uh, covers uh, involvement um, between the French and the Americans uh, during, during various wars. Of the Civil War, for example, uh, the French did not get directly involved, but they were siding with the Confederacy. Some French military actually fought on the side of the Confederacy, but they did not get uh, directly involved. And then I cover World War I and World War II, and the North Carolina Archives uh, has a wonderful collection of, um, of family uh, personal belongings of um, soldiers, young men who uh, fought in World War I and World War II. Um, in France. And in fact, the bell tower at North Carolina State University, most of you probably know, it's um, a memorial to World War I alumni of NC State who fell in battle. And 21 of the 33 names in the bell tower, um, those gentlemen uh, died in France, some are buried in France, or died on the way to France of various diseases. Then the final chapter of the book sort of discusses um, in France today. Just as an example, I had the pleasure of traveling throughout uh, the state of North Carolina and going to archives. This is the uh, Tryon Paris Carawire Library, which has a wonderful collection of, of, of French uh, items of French provenance. I uh, went to uh, courthouses, register of deeds, museums, family homes, and had just a wonderful time traveling around the state and piecemealing together the uh, various remnants of French presence of North Carolina. First discovery. So I'm going to give you just a little taste of the first two chapters that the first Europeans to set foot in North Carolina, first European to set foot in North Carolina was actually a French person. This is Giovanni de Verrazzano. He's an Italian and he was the explorer who came to North Carolina. He was uh, from Italy, migrated to France, to Lyon, and then further north to Paris. And why, what's an Italian doing in, Fran uh, doing in France? Well, it's because of this gentleman. This is Francois Premier, Francis I, the great French Renaissance king. He's a gentleman who uh, brought France into the modern world. He was a uh, handsome, athletic, uh, very well-read, learned man. And as a young man in his early 20s, he was uh, fighting wars in Northern Italy and he was captured and he became a royal prisoner for a couple of years in uh, Italy and also in Spain. When he was in Italy, he marveled at the advances that the Italians had over the French in their art, their architecture, uh, their cuisine, of course, and they had banks and they had a solid monetary system. So after he was released, he invited many um, Italian artists and architects, uh, explorers like Verrazzano, Leonardo da Vinci even came to France and uh, died, died in France. And so there was this great Italian influence uh, in France at the time, uh, supported by Francis I. So he hires uh, Verrazzano to sail over to the New World. He's competing with Henry VIII and Phil of Spain to you know, find the New World and, and to go bring back its riches. So Verrazzano and his brother Herolamo, who was the map maker and a small uh, retinue uh, of Italian assistants went, but it was a French ship sailed by a French captain um, of the name of Antoine de Gonflant. And this is the Dauphine. And this ship came to the coast of North Carolina in 1524. And this is commemorated um, by the historical marker of High Knoll Shores, just um, outside the North Carolina uh, Aquarium. And so the um, Florentine ship, uh, sorry, Florentine uh, Verrazzano sailing under the French flag. And we know pretty much the exact location. Uh, Verrazzano kept very, very precise uh, ship log and an account of his journey. So there's the approximate spot in um, late February, early March, 1524. 
And I went to that same spot around the same time um, to, to the spot where the ship would have anchored offshore in which they did, and Barrett Sonner writes about this in his journal, they anchored offshore and they sent one of the young captain boys, a young French boy who was swimming close to shore to throw a bag of trinkets on the shore for uh, the Native Americans they saw there. By accident, he had caught in one of those winter waves, washed ashore. The Native Americans took the young boy, brought him over to the fire, took off his clothes, and the men on the ship were horrified. They thought they were going to eat him alive as they had read in all the, the cannibal legends. Um, the Native Americans, they warmed him by the fire, dried his clothes, and put him back um, so he could swim back to the ship. And that was the first person to uh, set foot on North Carolina was this young uh, Frenchman from probably from uh, Normandy, France. So Veritzana continues up the coast. He's going to go all the way up to Rhode Island to Nova Scotia. And as he gets to the area of sort of Cape Hatteras, he looks out beyond the sandbars and he sees this great, vast uh, body of water, the Pamlico Sound. And he thought, oh, I found it. This is what you know the king sent me here for. Um, I, I found the Pacific Ocean. I found the gateway to the east. And that's what all the European explorers were from Columbus on were trying to find. And he describes uh, the land of the Outer Banks as sort of a, a, an Arcadia, a paradise on earth. He talks about the, the natural beauty and all the abundant resources that were there. And he, he writes very, very passionately about this. His brother, Hirolimo, um, drew a map of the journey. And down here is Florida, you can see. And then this is the coast of North Carolina. And here you can't see in this image all that well, but these are three French flags that he claimed for the French crown. This is an approximate area of Cape Hatteras. And here in uh, Latin, it, uh, he wrote Novo Gallia, New France. So he came to France, uh, claimed the area for France. And here, this is the Mare Occidentale, the Western Sea. He thought the Pamlico Sound mistakenly was uh, the Atlantic Ocean. So Verrazzano goes back to Europe and he uh, publishes his account. And this is one of the books that Sir Walter Raleigh uh, read as he was putting together his plans to explore uh, the new world. And it's really no coincidence that um, so Walter Raleigh ends up back approximately in the same place that Verrazzano had described. So again, we know that you know, the French did not colonize North Carolina, the English did um, from this point onward, but Verrazzano sort of opened the way for Sir Walter Raleigh to, find, to, to come back to this area and find the way through North Carolina. This is um, moving forward a bit. This is a map from the 1660s. It's a French map of La Caroline, uh, here is the Albemarle Sound here, and here's the Comte d'Albemarle, Albemarle County. Albemarle is actually a French word meaning uh, rich soil. So North Carolina uh, was on the French radar screen, but they ended up settling Quebec in the Mississippi Basin in the Caribbean and never really getting a strong colonial foothold in North Carolina. But the French will come here in another way. And this is the second chapter covers uh, Huguenot migrations. The French uh, Huguenots were Protestants. There was terrible persecution in the 1500s. They were finally given religious freedom in the late 1500s. And the Huguenots were, um, they were not landed aristocracy. So they had to make their own way in the world. They were uh, very educated. Many of them were bankers and lawyers and doctors and craftspeople. And they, had an uncomfortable relationship with the Catholics and the, and the French government, but they were accepted more or less for about 50 or 60 years until the French Sun King, Louis XIV, revoked uh, freedom of religion for the Protestants in 1685. And at that point, if you were a Protestant, you had three choices. You could either recant and convert to Catholicism. Uh, if you don't do that, you risk persecution, torture, um, or if you had the means, then you could flee the country. And about 500,000 uh, Protestants uh, left the country, about half a million people. It was a great brain drain for France. Many went to Amsterdam, some went to Germany, Switzerland, some went to England. And this is called the, the Huguenot diaspora. Many of them went to um, uh, London 
and they stayed there for some time and they set up shop and they added to the economy. But the English didn't want the French there forever. And they were trying to populate the new world. They were trying to populate Virginia. In doing so, they did not want to depopulate their own country. So they would provide passage for immigrant groups such as the French, such as the German and the Scots um, to come uh, to the new world and uh, help colonize uh, the area. So in the late 1600s, right around 1700, uh, three ships come from London sequentially to, to Virginia. And this is one of the most fascinating documents that I, I found in the archives on Jones Street. It's a list of the French passengers on the ship, the Marion Inn, which went uh, to Norfolk. And it has the name of the head of household, uh, where they're from, uh, how many in his or her family. And so these passengers had been promised by the Lord's proprietor of Virginia that they were gonna get land in the Norfolk region of Virginia. And unfortunately, when they got there, that deal was sort of broken. There wasn't enough land, the governor said, and many of the Huguenots, some seven or 800 of them, ended up in a place called Mannequin Town, just to the west of Richmond. The area was not that fertile. The winter was harsher than they expected. Uh, they didn't fare all that well. So eventually there will be one of their pastors, Philip de Richburg, will take a group of several hundred uh, Huguenots down uh, south. They'll go down the James River to the Blackwater River the, to the Chowan River and end up in North Carolina. This is just a picture of Mannequin Town. It's a beautiful place. If you ever have an opportunity to go there, this is where the French Huguenots who settled in North Carolina originally came from after being in London. So here are some of the migration patterns of French Huguenots that came to North Carolina. They started coming onto the Albemarle from the Norfolk region in the 1680s. Eventually they will come down and help settle Bath in the early 1700s. And there are documents uh, that I have that I talk about in the book that show um, the, the French being uh, you know, sort of part of the founding members of the town of Bath. And they will eventually end up in the Craven County and down as far as Beaufort, and they will start to spread through the area. Now the Huguenots were not more than um, maybe one or 2% of the population, but the Huguenots um, you know, in, in North Carolina at the time, but they, they have um, qualities that are very dear uh, to uh, uh, American ideals, uh, such as uh, love of liberty, self-reliance, freedom of worship. Some of our founding fathers of this country, Paul Revere and John Adams are French Huguenots. So the Huguenots are really very, very um, integral part of a colonial frontier in North Carolina. There's uh, a great legend, everybody knows about the lost colony of, of Roanoke. And this is, um, as I was doing the research, um, some people in New Bern put me on the track of, of the French lost colony. So this piqued my interest, and there's a whole chapter on uh, the French Lost Colony, and this is the approximate location where the colony was, and I'm going to explain in a minute that the colony was not really lost. Um, they sort of just dissipated into the social fabric uh, of the state. So early 1700s, those Huguenots, they migrated here, they set up a colony. Right at the time of the Tuscarora War, so the timing was bad, they suffered some heavy casualties. Um, some of them decided to leave and go to South Carolina, but some remained. And so further documentation I found as I was doing my research in New Bern, this is a landing from 1764, and it's this approximate side, the south side of the Trent, just two miles outside of New Bern, there was a place called Frenchtown. So in fact, there was a French colony there even 60 years later um, in, uh, to, to the west of New Bern. That's the location of French town where there was a French colony. Here's some evidence from the courthouse from the Register of Deeds. Um, you know, I, have, I found hundreds of land deeds and visited cemeteries all throughout the state. And this is a very um, well-known French name in the Beaufort area, the Dupuy family. This, uh, he signs his land deed as William Dupuy. So his name has been anglicized from Guillaume. Um, and so this is a land deed from probably around 1720, uh, I'm sorry, 1741. 
And this is one of the, my favorite uh, documents in the book. Uh, this is a landing written in French from 1793 of a gentleman of Adrien Barry from Craven County. And so it shows that, in fact, there was, there was a, a significant um, you know, French presence in, um, in, the, in, in, in the area at that time, a hundred years later after the initial migrations. And so this is the final part of the, this idea that, um, you know, what happened to the French, what happened to the French lost colony, and they really weren't lost necessarily, but, you know, there were only so many French families, so eventually they started to marry into English families, and a lot of the names became anglicized, and they became integrated into, um, you know, English names. Some of the names stayed the same. There are a lot of Lanier's in North Carolina. There's a lot of La Roques in North Carolina. Um, you can see how a name like Fonvier becomes Fonville. And so these early Huguenots were part of, um, you know, the mel early melting pot of, of Eastern North Carolina. And today there may be people who are in attendance this evening who um, can maybe trace their ancestry uh, back um, to these names. There's a very active um, French Huguenot Society of North Carolina that I've collaborated with. And again, my book is not purely a uh, book about genealogy, but the family history of the French plays significantly into the population of North Carolina. Now we're gonna go get to, back to on track here, what people are really here for, is uh, the French, French Mercy train comes to Raleigh. So on February 3rd, uh, 1949, this is a picture of Manhattan, 200,000 New Yorkers gathered along Broadway in Manhattan. Three boxcars filled with French goods travel up the avenue, painted with the insignia of the 40 French regions and a tricolor band with the words Train de la Reconnaissance Française, French Gratitude Train. France said gratitude trains to all 49 US states and appreciation for securing the allied victory over Nazi Germany and liberating France from occupation. And here's an image of the train de la reconnaissance française. Now, two years earlier, the American friendship train inspired this generous gift of the French. In 1947, an American effort was launched to support the reconstruction of Europe, part of the Marshall Plan, and the US sent 700 boxcars filled with food, clothing, and fuel to France to try to help them get back on their feet. And this inspired a French railway worker named Onsley Picard to create a committee to provide a reciprocal gift um, to the Americans. And that's how the French friendship train uh, started out. And as uh, Jordan mentioned a little bit ago, the, the, the collection of items is incredible. And the French response was overwhelming. Even though most people didn't have much after the war, the prime minister, Robert Schuman encouraged them to give what they could. And 6 million people donated over 52,000 items. Um, and we saw a nice little collection of them um, a few minutes ago from um, Jordan. And one descendant even gave, one descendant of Marquis de Lafayette even uh, donated his cane. And we saw some seedling packages. Some states received oak trees. And I was um, giving a presentation a few months ago uh, to the Alliance Francaise, the French Alliance Cultural Organization in Raleigh. And a woman in attendance was from the Alliance Francaise of, um, of Oklahoma, in Oklahoma City. And so she said that they have uh, French oak trees growing there even today. And that was for you, First Lady Cooper, if you're in attendance, um, the French oak trees growing in, in Oklahoma. And Jordan showed us this, this is the symbol of the French gratitude train. And in French, la connaissance is a very strong word about recognition and deep appreciation. And so it's an image of a steam engine. And these are flowers from Flanders Fields, um, which is in uh, north, the northeast part of France where um, many, many, you know, hundreds of thousands of soldiers from the, the British Empire and Americans died. And so those uh, symbol of Flanders Fields as a reminder and a thanks to le peuple américain, to the American people um, for the sacrifice that we made on their behalf. And you have the French uh, colors of the French flag, which coincidentally are the same as the United States. 
red, white, and blue, except the French have it backwards. They called it bleu, blanc, et rouge. And Jordan also showed us one of the labels, and I don't have a handwritten note here, but this is, you know, every gift has this label, and the French are very, very precise about documenting their history and about documenting things. This is from uh, Madame Aubin in Paris, and um, this is actually um, a picture, I believe, from the North Carolina archives. Now, the boxcar itself is perhaps the most interesting artifact. These were French military boxcars. They were built between 1872 and 1885. They were used in World War I and World War II to transport troops and horses. Many American soldiers rode in these boxcars to battlefronts during both wars. And the French call the boxcars hommes quarante chevaux huit, since they were designed to carry either 40 men or eight horses. Some of the boxcars of other states have suffered decaying vandalism over the years and no longer with us, but North Carolina's boxcar is intact, in excellent condition, and on display at the Museum of Transportation in Spencer. It was brought there in 1981 after it was repaired and restored in Wilson by the North Carolina chapter of the 40 and 8 Society. And when I visited uh, doing my research on the gratitude train, I was given the privilege of uh, peering inside uh, one of the boxcars and, and photographing it. And it was, I was eerily transported into the past. And um, if 40 men were in that boxcar, they could just basically sit up while they were transported. There was no bedding, it was very, very rough conditions. And it smelled like horses too. So North Carolina's Merci train, the nickname, uh, thank you train came to Raleigh. Um, February 18th, 1949. This is uh, Governor William Carr Scott uh, welcomed the contingent of French dignitaries who had accompanied the train. And he looks really excited here, doesn't he? He's about ready to jump out of the car because he wants to go meet the Countess, the Countess de Feiss. And she, this woman here in the fur coat, was the chair of the Paris Committee that oversaw the implementation of the French gratitude train. So she came down to Raleigh with a group of French dignitaries. I have not been able to identify the woman to her right, could perhaps be her personal attache. There was a parade down Fayetteville Street, um, music provided by bands from Camp Lejeune and Fort Bragg marched through downtown in his welcoming, uh, this Uncle Sam, in his welcoming remarks, Jonathan Daniels, uh, editor at the time of the Raleigh News and Observer, recalled that the Marquis de Lafayette, great uh, American ally of the Revolutionary War, had ridden in a similar parade of Fayetteville Street in an open carriage during his tour of the South in 1825. And that's a fascinating story too that I write about in the book on a uh, chapter on revolutionary allies. Uh, Mr. Daniels also expressed uh, the people of North Carolina's gratitude to the French for their friendship and generosity. And then just a couple of photos. The Comtesse gets to meet Uncle Sam and she and the governor are having a nice little conversation. This is just an aside, this photo popped up when I was looking through the archives. Also participated in the ceremony was a gentleman named R. V. Colley. He was the last living Confederate veteran in the state who returned 105 a few days earlier. I thought that was pretty extraordinary. French boxcars getting unloaded. It was filled from floor to ceiling with wooden crates. In the Hall of History, uh, precursor to today's uh, Museum of History, the containers were unpacked with excitement and wonder. Here's the invitation. And here's the inside of the hall, uh, starting to unpack the boxes. And it is fascinating to see the well-dressed women of the Raleigh Women's Club unpacking the crates and admiring the items while uh, school children looked on. It's a demi -toss set, local school kids. It's a great collection of photographs. We're so fortunate. Uh, I really like this one. I picked it out. It's uh, two, two scouts um, admiring a French handcrafted miniature sailboat. 
Now, some of the items were donated to museums, libraries, and schools around the state, but most of the gifts were kept and ultimately housed, as you've seen, in the North Carolina Museum of History. And we're very fortunate since um, a lot of the other states, uh, the gifts were kind of dispersed and weren't kept in one place. They were cataloged as well. So um, we have a really, really unique collection, really, really rich collection compared to some other states. I love this part. In the following months, a trailer was equipped with an exhibit of the gifts and it traveled around the state from school to school, bring a little bit of France for all of North Carolinians to enjoy. North Carolina's thank you gifts. This is the, the trailer in uh, Rocky Mount. And here's another view of it. I'm not sure where this is, but two little girls peeking in at the French, French gifts. So for me, just I picked out a, a few um, of, the, of the gifts that I thought kind of noteworthy to me. This is the French uh, peasant style gown and it's, um, it's hand knit and it's just very simple and I just really enjoyed it. This is a watercolor painting from uh, the Savoie region, the Savoy region, which is in the Southwest of France near the Italian border. And in the book, I talk about the Valdenses of Valdez, the French and Italians who came over here in the late 1800s. And this is the area from which they hailed. So I thought that was kind of interesting that this painting is in the collection and that the Valdensians came from this area. And finally, this is a textile patch from the town of Le Havre in Normandy. And this is where the ship La Dauphine of Antoine de Gonflans and Giovanni Verrazzano sailed from. Um, in 1524 to come to North Carolina. The patch displays the royal symbol of French Renaissance King Francis I, who made the voyage possible, as I mentioned. And it's also an interesting coincidence that uh, the, the, the boxcars were um, shipped over on this uh, boat uh, called the Magellan and uh, with the Merci America sign on it. Here it is entering New York Harbor, the Statue of Liberty. And it also said uh, out of Le Havre, France. I thought that was interesting how it ties together, you know, the French and the friendship train in North Carolina with the bigger picture of French appreciation to Americans. Now, Jordan showed us uh, up close the real items. I just have some photographs. I'm just going to walk us through uh, just a few of the items that I picked out from the um, museum's um, photographic uh, archive that's online. Again, most of these are household items from families that were just going up in their attics and rummaging around and getting what they could. Um, this is a collection of 300 postcards celebrating the 300th anniversary of alsace lorraine There are dozens of hand-woven scarves. It's a nice little tourist scarf from Paris. Welcome to Paris, vive Paris. I really like this one because of the color pattern and there's insects in it and all kinds, very joyful. And there's one more. This is sort of a medieval a floral. You can see the people's costumes here. This is early Middle Ages and very beautiful floral design. I'm not sure which castle that is in the background. I think Jordan showed us this uh, lacquered fan with a brass ring. It's very delicate. It's probably very fragile. She also mentioned numerous handmade dolls representing traditional costumes of France and the Francophone world. This one is from Alsace-Lorraine on the German border. This is an Algerian doll. And this is um, a Basque country, French Basque boy. This is an interesting uh, item. It's a, a decorative porcelain serving dish emblazoned with a French proverb in the title, um, the true sardines of the uh, brothers of Mieux. So this is a, they have a sardine company and anybody that has appreciated French food, French food not only is supposed to taste good, but it's supposed to be presented visually and artistically, and it's supposed to be presented, you know, artistically on a, a sort of on a very um, artistically designed plate for your for your um, for your aesthetic as well as culinary pleasure, if you will. I think Jordan showed one of these. These are hand um, sewn leather lapel pins from Normandy to. Uh, depicting people in traditional Norman clothing. So you get a glimpse into the history of the past, how people dressed, friendship very tied to their history. 
an elegant gold sweater pen in the shape of uh, sheaves of wheat. This is an Art Deco necklace from the 1920s. So in the 1920s, we had the Roaring Twenties in the United States. The French had the Les Années Folles, the crazy years. That was the age of the jazz age. And it was a great, you know, great period of uh, vibrancy and culture before the Great uh, Depression and the crash of the stock market. These are two miniature paintings of uh, Marie Antoinette and Napoleon Bonaparte, two very famous French icons, neither of whom were French. Marie Antoinette was um, Austrian and Napoleon was Corsican, but um, it's nice to have these in our collection. That's uh, the back of a graceful porcelain mirror that caught my eye. It's a watercolor painting of a sea scene from Normandy. It's kind of reminiscent of a Claude Monet. I would really like to see this in person. What I've seen, it's an exquisitely uh, handcrafted wooden tray, uh, individual pieces of wood of different colors assembled um, by, by, by an artisan. They're decorative wooden boxes, the numerous, I think there are many of them. Jordan showed us um, something similar here. This is a wall pocket representing a cornucopia. This is a vibrantly hand-woven table, uh, table covering. This is an interesting document. This is an 1859 military citation of the Legion of Honor signed by Emperor Napoleon, um, Louis Napoleon. He was the emperor during the Civil War and he was thinking of getting involved, but decided not to. These are mint commemorative coins of American presidents, Eisenhower, Washington, Lafayette, Lafayette, Washington were very, very close, and George Patton. And so the, the French, you know, understand the importance of the French-American alliance in the Revolutionary War and greatly appreciated our efforts in uh, the First and Second World Wars and, and saving the country. This is an engraving of a French village. I'm not sure which one it is. It looks like it's in Normandy. It could be Enfleur because of the wooden homes. It's town of Bentou. And we did see one of the wind-up cars uh, a little while ago. And here's another one that I don't know. But it's got the little wind-up thing on the side. And finally, at the end, this is just um, a charming painting of an Alsatian girl, complete with the shine of fluorescent lights of the NC archives or the museum when many of the objects were cataloged and photographed, I think, back in the 1960s. So we have um, an exquisite collection here in um, Raleigh, and that's the story of the Merci train in Raleigh. And I'm going to end my presentation there and um, stop the share and just come back to you all. And I'll be glad to answer questions um, if there are any or comments. Thank you so much, Dr. Markey. That was awesome. Um, our adult programs intern, Adara, is actually going to ask you the questions from the folks who've joined us this evening. So I'm going to turn okay. it over to her. My pleasure. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm Adara, the adult education programs intern. Hi. And we have a few questions from the audience tonight. Um, let's start off with... Uh, where did the items from the train go that were not that are not currently with the museum i don't know that would have that would be a question for the museum experts i i don't know and do you one know of them, one, of, one of them's in the governor's mansion i know that <laughs> and do you know what the intent was to distribute these items were they for the general population or to be held with the states I don't think the French um, had a particular design of what they were doing. They were just trying to, you know, show their gratitude and get, give the gifts to the states. I think they let the states decide. And it's obviously that some states did, you know, who knows who got a hold of them. Um, I don't even know if our collection is completely intact. Um, that's a, that's a, those are fascinating questions that, uh, about which I can't answer. Um, but the French provided the gifts and let us do what we will with them. And then would you mind elaborating on the Waldensians? The Waldensians, yeah, it's a fairly complex story, but they were early Protestants, people who were persecuted early in the um, 
in the 12th and 13th century in France, and eventually they, um, they, they left in the 1800s because for economic reasons, and they came to New York and they came down to the town of Valdez, in Western North Carolina, and they set up shop there. And if anybody's been to Valdez, they brought their culture with them. Um, again, some were Italian speaking, some were French speaking, since that Valdensian region is right there in the Italian French border. Uh, and they settled in, and if one goes to Baldi's today, they have the old village set up. You can see how they worship. You can see the schoolhouses, and there's a um, you know tradition. There was a tradition of French culture there. At one point, back in the early 1900s, there was even a French. Um, there was even a Sears and Roebuck catalog that was uh, in French. And the Valdensians, they became good woodworkers, and also they were very good uh, textile weavers, and they had textile mills, and they're very very successful sort of French Italian immigrant group in North Carolina. Thank you. Um, do you know if any of the French expelled from Nova Scotia settled in North Carolina? That's a good question. Some did come this far. And that's some research I'm working on now is the migration from Canada. Um, there's a couple of families in Beaufort who came down here in um, the 18, late 1800s. and. Um, from, from Nova Scotia and from other, elsewhere in Canada. Um, and so that's um, so another project I'm working on with um, a colleague from Montreal, actually. Excellent question, yeah. And do you know if any of the gratitude trains were sent to other nations outside of the US? Not that I know of. I mean, without you know the United States, France would be a German speaking country today. You know, and the French um, gratitude towards the U.S., um, especially for the Second World War, is immense. And even though it's disappearing a little bit in the younger generation, but um, we were the ones that came and really, you know, sa saved France. So that was meant just for us. They were one for each state. Yep. Thank you. I think that's about all the questions we have. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Adara. Thank you, Adara. And thank you so much, Dr. Markey, for your presentation. And thank you so much, First Lady Cooper, for joining us this evening. And thank you to Jordan for joining us as well and showing us those great items. Um, it was it was such a special presentation, such a special program. So thank you all. Um, and thank you to those of us who joined us this evening. Um, we hope that we will see you at our next adult evening program happening on August 25th at 7 p.m., History and Highballs East Fork Pottery with Alex Matisse. In the meantime, we hope all of you have a lovely evening. We'll see you soon. Take care. Bye, guys. Bye. Au revoir. <laughs>